we are absolutely thrilled to welcome back two great friends of the show, Nan Lee and Zavendar. It's no surprise to see them joining forces in co-founding Dimension Capital. And if it wasn't clear from our first roundtable episode with them, the chemistry between these two is phenomenal. So Zav and Nan, thank you once again for joining us back on BIOS. As always, a pleasure to highlight and host you. Thanks for having us Thanks back. Thanks for having us. To help host today's episode, I'm joined by my colleague and BIOS manager, Drew Yashard. Drew, do you want to kick things off with our first topic? 100%. Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction. And thanks again, Zavin and Nan, for, for coming back on. We're so excited to dive in here. Uh, really just starting with the journey to mention and then building an enduring VC fund. Uh, we, we've, as Chris mentioned, had you on before to chat about your backgrounds and what's led you to this moment. And we're so excited to discuss the, the genesis formation and future genesis uh, of Dimension with you both. So let's kick things off here. Um, for, for those of you who have not seen our roundtable along with our podcast with Zavin and Nan, um, again, highly recommend you listen, but especially for some more context on our guests and backgrounds, um, uh, making the story today. Um, would you first be willing just to share a quick, uh, background on, on, on yourselves, a quick overview? Zavin, maybe could you start? Yeah, I'll go brief. And uh, I guess if anyone has any questions, they could, they could go back to prior episodes that we've been on. Uh, I studied a mix of math, computer science, and philosophy for undergrad and graduate studies at Stanford. Uh, directly after undergrad and grad school was in and around kind of the software ecosystem. This was 2010 to 2011, 2012, 2013. Uh, cut my teeth in the quote unquote big data days. Uh, was at a search engine startup that was ultimately acquired by Twitter. I uh, really realized I didn't want to be in social media. Uh, so quit Twitter just after uh, one or two days and then uh, kind of wound around kind of the, the tech and ML uh, ecosystem. Uh, for those of you all who are basketball fans, I spent time advising the, the 76ers on machine learning and data strategy and candidly ported a lot of learnings from integrating software and machine learning and data science into uh, into sports uh, that, that carry over and translate well into biotech and pharma. Um, in many ways, I actually think biotech and pharma is a harder uh, ecosystem where there's more uh, cultural and um, intellectual inertia uh, in and around accepting methodological updates and changes vis-a-vis uh, -vis software or data and ML. Um, ended up in venture uh, where I met Nan Lee first at Innovation Endeavors, which at least then, this was 2013, 2014, was essentially Eric Schmidt's family office. He was transitioning from chairman and CEO of Alphabet Google uh, very much into what he is today, a uh, global tech evangelist. And he used his uh, kind of personal balance sheet uh, as a flashlight to see what sciences and technologies were coming down the pike. Uh, Nan and I became very, very, very good friends. I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but I'll, I'll say that we were roommates in Oakland. We taught together at Stanford for four or five years. Um, and then ultimately I met Adam Goldburn, our third co-founder uh, at JP Morgan, uh, the uh, mingling coupling event in 2014. Adam and I actually met two hours before he met his now wife. So in the span of about six hours, he met his work partner and his life partner, uh, which which Nan and I both gave him uh, a good amount of shit for. Um, within nine months of meeting Adam, so January to September of 2014, he had pushed me over to Lux. And then for the last eight years, Adam and I were really fortunate to help establish the biotech franchise. Uh, at Lux, which was a phenomenal firm. Um, we scaled uh, assets from you know, a few hundred million to over 4 billion and scaled the portfolio from 30 to uh, over 200 uh, portfolio companies. Uh, Adam, a stem cell biologist, myself, a computer scientist, best friends, uh, very lucky to kind of sharpen each other's metal uh, between the two uh, uh, disciplines. And I think it was a little bit of right place, right time. Uh, between Nan, Adam, and myself in, in arriving where we were and realizing that we were amongst a vanishingly few number of people who spoke this continuum of, lang of languages that is um, increasingly powerful and I think will define the coming decades of, uh, of alpha, both in venture of the asset class, but in also uh, in terms of the, the large contributors to both humanity and also, of course, the economy. Fantastic. I uh, love the overview on Dimension, the, some of the Genesis stories there. Nan, would you want to give a quick overview? Um, yeah. Read that things off? Yeah, happy to. And I'll, I'll go backwards. Um, so I, I really uh, grew up in the venture industry. So have spent uh, over a, a decade now, I think, going on year 13, uh, all in early stage venture capital across a few different firms. Uh, most recently, and, and my longest stint by far, was at Obvious Ventures, an FSF-based venture fund. 
focused on tech transformation of offline industries. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be at that firm when it was first launched in Fund 1 and uh, stayed through Fund 4, uh, where I became an, a, a full equal GP through that journey. Uh, I led the Frontier Tech practice at Obvious, and a lot of the work, and increasingly so as my career progressed, uh, was, was very much centered on, on the life sciences for a lot of the reasons that Zav mentioned. Uh, my background is, is similarly dual computer science math, so I come at the space from a very much a data and computational angle, and uh, I found myself in life science by pulling on the threads of, you know, where can we apply this increasingly mature technology? Uh, if you were a student of, of venture and of technology over the last decade, since 2010, you really saw large-scale data sets, distributed compute, uh, infrastructure, and machine learning hit mature uh, states and hit the enterprise. So for, for a generalist uh, frontier tech investor, it really became a question of what are the most interesting applications? What are the most data rich and value centric applications? And life science and healthcare very much came into the forefront from that. Uh, before that, uh, I was uh, overlapped with Zav. We were co-workers and, and had desks next to each other at Innovation Endeavors, Eric Schmidt's, uh, Eric Schmidt's venture fund. And I very much credit both of our career arcs to that experience because Eric is a really broad technological thinker. He thinks in terms of decades and not years and certainly not months. And uh, we had a, a really open hunting license to go look at frontier tech before before it was even coined as an industry. We were able to explore a lot of really interesting nascent technologies. Uh, and then by background, first-gen immigrant from China, uh, immigrated here with my family uh, when I was very young and grew up outside of Detroit. Fantastic. Love the overview here. Um, would love to bring it back to uh, 2022 here, folks, and kick things off. I mean, for those who have missed the headline grabbing news, uh, can you first just give an overview? You know, what is Dimension? Yeah, so so Dimension is is very much the culmination of our venture careers. Uh, Zav and I both talked about our journeys over the better part of a decade investing in Frontier Tech and then increase, investing increasingly in Frontier Tech applied to life science products. And Dimension is a, is a purpose-built firm to continue that journey and, and really go all in on this category. So it, it's, it's set up as a dedicated specialty firm at the intersection between technology and the life sciences. So very much a multi-fluent firm that embraces life science product development and the, the idiosyncratic uh, uh, pursuit of building a, a medicine and taking it to clinic and taking it through regulatory hurdles. Uh, but also equally, we, we're a firm that respects and is optimistic about technology and software and machine learning. And we see those two fields uh, very much merging in the companies that we back and in the industry leaders that, that drive progress in the space. And uh, I would say as a venture firm, we're, we're late to move into the, the space. We're following the entrepreneurs there but we're building uh, a multi-fluent firm to support multi-fluent founders. I think I think uh, late late to move in the space, certainly in terms of the entrepreneurial activity, um, from our vantage, first to move into the space from a cap markets perspective. And, and, and that really was kind of the genesis, uh, realizing that there was this amazing entrepreneurial hotbed of activity. Uh, not only in an academic setting, which uh, I think now is is commonplace both on the computational side where the, the leading academic com computer scientists are um, increasingly fluent in biology and chemistry, and then also vice versa. If you go to the Broad, Harvard, Stanford, Yale, so on and so forth, all of the leading molecular labs today are likely programming in TensorFlow and familiar with distributed, you know, non-trivial infrastructure software uh, to actually manage and, and deconvolute uh, to Nan's point, the, the increasingly large data sets that they're that they're building and maintaining and managing, um, but then also, of course, from an entrepreneurial setting, we really have seen this first gen, this 1.0 kind of, of of companies come to fruition. And whether it's a recursion or an Accentia, an Icon, uh, an Inveta, a lot of these companies are out and 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 actually increasingly so taking drugs into the clinic. Some of them are already public, um, and they're starting to show. Um, what's really interesting and heretofore, I think, has been vanishingly absent, if not entirely null in the ecosystem, um, compounding uh, economies of scale. And so uh, it, it compounding economies of scale in ways that really uh, resemble and mirror uh, the same sorts of network effects that we'd seen traditionally in Silicon Valley on the tech side. 
Uh, and Manan, Adam, and I kind of realized that and then also realized there wasn't a firm um, who was equally weighted on discovery and development, on biology and chemistry, on software and machine learning and automation. Uh, we, we realized there was a magnificent opportunity to go and create and establish that firm, but also that if we did it well and if we did it right, we would have a, a small modicum or an iota of a role to play in really accelerating the ecosystem forward. Uh, and that was a calling that was that was too candidly was too great to pass up. Yeah, lo love to hear the the genesis story and, and the moment of oh we, we have to start this we have to get going. Um, and I think diving forward, um, something you mentioned in your your past and previous history um, was this level of of friendship uh, between uh, you Zavin Nan and, and Adam uh, when founding this. Uh, both through innovation endeavors and, and, and Stanford and, and, you know, Zavin with you at, at JPM, right? I mean, that's unbelievable. Um, could, could you talk about founder cohesion, especially when starting a venture fund, early culture, and maybe how this friendship just helps Dimension Capital overall? It's, um, on, on one hand, it, it, there's a little bit of a garage band element. Uh, I think in a parallel universe, the three of us met in high school and Nan was lead singer, Adam played bass, and I had a tambourine in the corner that I would bang. Uh, and in, in this world, it just happens to be we're starting a, a venture firm. Um, I don't want to understate the importance of communication, transparency, and trust, um, I think, in any venture firm. And it's it's not a hidden secret that if you walk into the venture firms in Sandhill, the vast majority of them, you could probably cut the internal political nature or tension between the partnership with a butter knife. Um, it's a really hard industry where... Every Monday you come in and you talk about deals that on mean and median tend to go to zero and you debate out the merits of deploying capital behind them with eight or nine or 10 really intelligent people who will tell you all of the reasons why things fail. And the only way for those conversations to persist and to be productive over time is to have a strong substrate and a true North Star that aligns not only the partnership, but then also the firm. Um, so that's really critical. On the other hand, Nan, Adam, and I are all extremely competitive, not between ourselves, but I think in terms of what we aspire for Dimension to become. And so this isn't just a collection of three friends. I think this has the chance, if we do it right, to be amongst the best investment firms on the planet. That will take years to manifest and, and, and to come to fruition. But it, it's certainly that kind of true north and that, that level of ambition that brought us to kind of take the entrepreneurial leap, as Nan would say, and found the firm. We yeah, have. and I, I think I think that friendship, you know, on our side is, is both personal and professional, and and they do tend to feed into each other, where we have a shared mutual respect for each other as thinkers and investors, and we've seen enough data from from our track records and backgrounds to understand, although we think differently and we make slightly different sort of deci decisions, uh, we we've definitely been able to to assemble a team that's not per perfectly overlapped. We don't want to be carbon copies of each other, but we really want to add different flavors to the conversation of what's being considered and how we ultimately underwrite. Uh, and I think that's really important. And then I think there's a common thread of optimism and and passion for an, having a front row ticket to seeing an industry go through significant change and a feeling of we were born in the right place in the right time, maybe not for the garage band, but for what we're doing, we are exceptionally lucky to have been uh, active investors through the 2010s when a lot of the technology was being developed and been at firms that enabled us to take uh, bigger swings in unexplored spaces and didn't have to follow any kind of pattern from a well-established venture category. And, and I think we were all uh, actively investing in Frontier Tech at the perfect time to watch life science healthcare go through this really drastic change. Uh, so I think for the three of us, that was the calling card. It was the, the, the perfect storm of, it's an opportunity to work with some of your best friends and closest trusted partners in the industry, plus an opportunity to build a sector only firm in a brand new sector that's being formed uh, that we think will define the whole category in 10 years, 20 years time. Uh, that's just too good to pass up. And it, it, it truly feels once in a lifetime type of opportunity. No, it's great. And, and I think um, that, that explanation of timing uh, really uh, interests me. Uh, within Dimension, I mean, you all mentioned that in, in some cases of the entrepreneurial curve, you're late to the game, right? Um, I mean, I, I, I think of this as a typical VC quote that 
gets thrown around a lot, right? And rightfully so, right? Timing is everything. Um, in, in past thought leadership, uh, you have all described that dimension was something you, uh, all of you have, have really thought about close to 10 years now, like you said, Nan. Um, thinking about timing the foundation of dimension, can we set the record straight? You know, why start a venture fund now specifically? You know, what were the indications that 2022 for you three, um, as you said, the melding of that culture um, was really the right time to start and launch dimension? Well, it goes without saying, it, it wasn't trying to time the markets. Uh, we, we didn't do a very good job of that. <laughs> and it wasn't trying to time uh, uh, international warfare. We didn't, get, we didn't do a good job of that. Uh, you know, I, I think. I think for us, it was really seeing uh, brick by brick, the, this this compounding momentum in the space. And we've been on this show talking about some of our exciting portfolio companies and seeing firsthand the effect of the platforms that they're building and the empirical proof points of this approach uh, in case study after case study. And uh, fast forward to 2022, some of those companies, the early pioneers of the space that we're fortunate to work with and back, they went public, they became value drivers in our prior funds portfolios, uh, it, it had really come full circle where it wasn't just intellectual fodder. It wasn't for frontier investors to take high risk bets, but it was really, it, it really came across as real meaningful clinical change and products were being developed through these methodologies. So that's number one. And then, then I think from the front row seat of being early stage investors, those two are related. We started seeing an explosion of entrepreneurial activity and talent and uh, new companies chasing this theme of building either a tech platform to serve life science or building a life science company that uses technology as a wedge. Uh, I would say if you rewind 10 years ago, five years ago, when we started doing this work, there were really interesting companies being built and we invested in some of them, but it, it's incomparable, the, the momentum and the, the flurry of activity now versus even five years ago. So it, it I really feel that the the mindset that we have is the space had really outgrown our ability to cover it with one inch of uh, the fun of our, our prior platforms, but really it, it demanded its own category uh, specific fund. There was just enough activity, enough value to be captured, enough companies to be supported that uh, we really felt Dimension needed to exist. We, we, we tell our partners uh, two things. One, um, if we do our jobs right on dimension one, fund one, we'll, of course, knock on wood, pick and partner and build trust and steward amongst the best companies exactly at this intersection and interface. Uh, the second is, I think we have a role to play, again, accelerating the entirety of the ecosystem. And it really does. And we do draw inspiration from, you know, the, the, the equivalent of the work that Matt and Fred did at Paradigm. Uh, not only in partnering with amazing kind of Bitcoin and Ethereum and crypto founders, but then in, for example, in their case, building and maintaining open source infrastructure software that would be connective glue between the disparate projects in the Web3 crypto space. Uh, we do draw inspiration between uh, what maybe Mickey Malta did at Rivet and FinTech in establishing a new kind of realm of underwriting principles for FinTech in a moment in time when it, it very much so wasn't in vogue. And then similarly, you know, maybe what, Kirsten Green has done it uh, with D2C at Forerunner. Again, picking a category and establishing a new underwriting uh, 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 regime uh, when that category is overlooked or underfavored, uh, I think we have a chance to do that and accelerate kind of the tech bio or bio plus uppercase T tech ecosystem um, if we do that right. Uh, the other <clears throat> part on timing, and again, you, you'll see likely a number of firms um, on Sandhill right now where there are key decision makers and, and, and now uh, you know recently promoted GPs who are sitting in those seats because of bets that maybe they made in VR or maybe they made in crypto. And maybe two or three years ago, those bets looked really good. And maybe now you're kind of wondering if those companies will ever see you know the light of day or, and or return a penny back to LPs from those investments. And so it really does take seven, eight, nine, 10 years to show success as a venture investor. I think you can show momentum, especially in a low interest rate environment, which is what we were in over the last decade, but showing that you can find and partner with an entrepreneur at the earliest innings, help build and grow a company, and then go through all of the kind of moment in life, uh, key kind of crucible moments up and through IPO. It just takes time. There's no circumventing that. 
And I think for each of Adam, Nan, and myself, we had established that and candidly found conviction and confidence in ourselves that it wasn't just, oh, we, we were able to find interesting companies that had momentum, but we were able to take companies up from private innings through public innings and ultimately also return capital to our investors in doing so. Makes sense. I mean, I, I love the, the the comment on timing. And I think certainly the three of you have your fair share of track record of the past 10 years of how you've dealt and how you navigated that. Um, I, I think as a continuation on timing, last question here, I, I'm really curious about the actual launch itself of Dimension. Um, you know, you had one of the best fund debuts of, of the ages, um, I would say, right? Ra- ra- arguably, um, you know, receiving recognition from Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Stat, Fierce. I mean, really, heck, even the NASDAQ gave you all a shout out in Times Square. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, as we're thinking about the creation of venture funds themselves, could you walk us through how you both think about when and how to launch a new fund? Um, and then in particular, a continuation of your questions, Avin, um, what really makes this the tipping point in tech bio to launch a fund? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, we're thrilled with the launch and it, it feels so good to get to get our story and mission out into the public after almost a year of building it internally so uh that was very cathartic uh and i, I think about the launch and its success to being closely tied to the entire fundraising and firm, and firm building process for dimension in that it was driven by authentic passion and driven by sort of objective changes happening in the industry that we could point to and we could actually connect uh, uh, our investors and journalists too directly. So uh, I think having an, uh, an authentic voice that's tied to uh, a pretty drastic change in the world really helped us in that uh, you know, we've, we tried very much not to follow any formulaic launch PR fodder, uh, not that we knew any anyways. So we, we very much winged it. Um, we, we spent as much time as we could with the journalists that covered the space and we tried to tell them our story and, you know, more so than, hey, look at the three of us and what we've built. Uh, we tried to point externally to look at how much awesome stuff is happening in this industry, whether it's uh, large uh, executive changeover at pharma uh, companies to, to, take, to take on this challenge and, and digitize uh, their infrastructure and their approach to fast growing private companies that we work with or we didn't work with and what they're doing in different uh, therapeutic and diagnostic fields, uh, I think that really resonated with with our press coverage. And uh, if you go through the coverage, it, it very much was around thematically what was happening in life science and the, the digitization of life science, and less so about dimension as a first fund and just the basic stats of the, the fundraising itself. So I, I think we you know, I would give us high marks in, in resonating with the audience there. And and I, I credit that mostly to uh, the industry having unignorable momentum. And we were able to just call that out. <clears throat> uh, Drew, the only, the only additions I'd add, one, I think a lot of it was just a continuation of the relationships that we built and established with, with journalists over the last decade. And, and so fortunate to have them kind of come to us and say, hey, we want to know what you're doing and whenever you're ready to talk about it, we want to be in a position to help you kind of blast it out. Uh, and then two, I think really strong alignment between Adam, Nod and myself that this wasn't a story about the three of us, but it was really a story about the entrepreneurs we had backed over the last decade. And then this moment in time for the broader kind of ecosystem and the entrepreneurial community um, and really kind of to Nod's point exactly highlighting a few of the breadcrumbs to let people then kind of create their own narrative, but giving people a little bit of the, the structure or the substrate uh, to kind of put that narrative together. Yeah, well-spoken and fantastic ads, Zavin. I think that's a great addition to what it takes to make a good launch. And certainly it's amazing to see that catharsis come to fruition for you also. Again, congrats. Um, I would, I would uh, continue a conversation, a question with you, Zavin. Um, you know, a firm's first few investments certainly are important for true, proving a track record, of, of course. Um, as we're walking through Dimension here in those first couple months, could you discuss how the three of you really think about who to partner with in your first couple months as Dimension's investing, kind of that, that first investment period as it's kicking in the gear? You know, we, we didn't plan it. And, and you'll notice when we launched, we had uh, four companies uh, already kind of pre-baked into the portfolio, three that um, that we could talk about and one that's still in stealth. Um, we, we certainly didn't plan uh, for that. I think when we when we first went up in front of the whiteboard in, um, in March 2022, 
the three of us probably said, okay, we'll for, first go spend our time fundraising and then we'll go and build the portfolio after after a, a close of the fund. Um, and the reality of the of the beast is it's not a spigot you can turn on and off. I think we'd bit, we'd spent obviously the the our nights and weekends and uh, dream cycles in this ecosystem for the last decade. And when we walked away from Lux and Obvious, it didn't mean that entrepreneurs were walking away from us, nor were our partners, nor were our co-investors, nor were our LPs, candidly. Um, and so when we when we did walk away in March, we were still, I think, very much in the center of the ecosystem. And um, and in in a way that surprised us, candidly, where we still had the opportunity to partner with uh, you know amazing entrepreneurs. Our first deal was was one that was highly competitive uh, before we had a name, and well before we had line of sight to a term sheet uh, to to any to any kind of committed capital from LPs, uh, and we were able to give a term sheet largely on trust to the entrepreneur in that moment in time and have them partner with us and select us over other established franchises on Sand Hill and and in Cambridge, candidly, um, which for us was really kind of eye opening frankly, but then also galvanizing and confidence inspiring. Um, from day one, our goal has been to partner with the best of the best entrepreneurs who are not only building the next generation of discovery platforms, which maybe get a lot of the attention, uh, but then also you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are digitizing uh, and building the rails and analytical tools and capabilities and next-gen kind of toolkits for the upstream discovery processes that will, that will candidly kind of be a part of the digitization of the life sciences, and then also downstream, the the, the companies that are um, leveraging technology to build next-gen manufacturing, development, and commercialization engines. And so what you see in the portfolio today um, is two software companies, one vertical SaaS uh, enterprise software company, Kaleidoscope, and you can think of that as a little bit of a, a GitHub or Asana uh, for preclinical uh, kind of multidisciplinary workflows and next-gen biotech. Uh, and the other is an open source infrastructure uh, database company, Lamin Labs, Lamin AI. Um, and so both of those are pure play software. The third that we can talk about is Inveta, which is a discovery platform. And Inveta is a company where Adam and I had led the Series A from Lux. We were intimately familiar with Viswa Kolaru, who is the founder CEO. He was one of the first employees at Recursion. He was a star at Recursion. And when he left Recursion, we had our eyes and ears on him to be in position to lead the Series A. And then when we left Lux, we had our eyes and ears again on him to be able to preempt the Series B. Um, but that's a little, you're, you're getting a little bit of the breadcrumbs of what I think you'll see the, the long-term portfolio look like, which is both a multitude of uh, business models, a multitude of modalities, software, hardware, automation, discovery, development, um, and then also a multitude of stages, really focusing at our bread and butter uh, earliest stages. So day of a company creation, pre-seed, seed, series A, but then also having the ability, especially with 350 raise at our hard cap, at our hard cap to flex up and to, you know, on a selective basis, uh, really lean into growth opportunities as well. I think it's a fantastic overview and it's a great prelude to um, what are the common threads behind the Dimension portfolio? And got really excited to to dive into Lava and, and, and Dimension and um, more of the investments that you all have made through Kaleidoscope and other folks in, in the future. Um, one quick question on the function of Dimension itself. Uh, I, I just think it's particularly fascinating from the backgrounds that you all have kind of come from. I mean, much of your careers has been spent at larger firms with established structures and cultures. Um, really just from your own perspective in the past year that you all have been building this together, could you describe some of the changes that you have faced in the past few months, working in a startup mentality, building a firm versus growing an established firm already? Um, have there been unexpected differences in your roles? Non, maybe would you want to kick the conversation off? Yeah, yeah. Drew, like you mentioned, the three of us were all GPs at our former firms and have been investing for, for quite some time. Um, so I, I felt I felt that we we had a handle on how to run a venture firm and how to invest. We've certainly been in our fair share of investment committee meetings and on and on our fair share of boards. Uh, what, we, what we came to realize is that the investing part of venture is really just the tip of the iceberg that's over the sort of above the water. And we ran full speed into what was under the water once we uh, started our own, our own firm in terms of the sort of hundreds of, of detailed items that it takes uh, on a foundational level, legal, finance, accounting, HR, hiring our first employer, employee was uh, a huge feat. So I really think we've come to appreciate the, the sort of 
uh, CEO and janitor mentality of being an early stage founder. And, and we're living it every single day uh, still to, to today. Um, so, so that was both a challenge and also a really interesting, interesting opportunity to, as you mentioned, escape the formulaic template of being at established firms that were, were at cruising altitude and had the right rails and had a, a lot of operational support. Uh, I, you know, I, I think we've come to really enjoy the blank slate uh, mentality here. It, it's incredibly freeing to think about how do we design a, a firm de novo that is specialized in this space. Given that we have high intentionality around the type of founders that we support and the type of ecosystem that we want to build, we can start to ask ourselves these questions of, let's let's throw everything at the wall. Uh, for example, Paradigm built their own in open source tools that they released to the community. We love that. We love this type of outside of the box thinking. And we're constantly still asking ourselves and challenging ourselves of what are the creative ideas that will resonate with founders? Founders are our customers and we get to have this really interesting platform. And with a $350 million fund, we're very well resourced to go build a lot of these ideas out. So we're, we're very excited and we're very much in the very beginning of putting some of those pieces in place. We certainly have a laundry list of different ideas of what we think can help the space sort of coalesce uh, around this tech meets biotech movement. And, and hopefully we continue to release some really interesting things that, that uh, are beneficial to founders and, and to, to startups. I think that's a fantastic addition. Um, and, and honestly, I, I, I love the mentality of a uh, founder and janitor in, in a way. Uh, we recently had Carlos Bustamante on, professor at Stanford, but mentioned the same kind of idea when he was founding Galatea himself and just saying, you know, you know I got to throw out the trash. Okay. I don't have an assistant to do that, right? I got to build this on my own. I think that's when, in my opinion, the rubber meets the road and things are really exciting. So congrats to you both. It's it's a fantastic yeah. mentality. You're um, speaking to the head of IT and the head of marketing here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Internet marketing and yeah, head of IT. Yeah, no, nope. nope. no, of course. Um, we, we want to, we want to keep things fun. We want to keep things, uh, interesting and rapid fire here, folks. I'm going to pass it over to Chris right now for a little halftime, uh, ask you all a couple rapid fire questions about the industry and yourself. Chris, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Drew. Thank you guys. Bringing this in a slightly different direction today, we're seeing as much innovation on the business side as the science side of the life sciences. And that innovation can at times be ahead of the market. As VCs whose investments cover this intersection of technology-enabled biosolutions, can you share how you think about go-to-market strategy, company journey uh, for this next wave of tech bio, biotech startups? Uh, I, I'm happy to chime in here. Uh, and I think Zav will, will agree uh, full force. You know, we think it's a game changer when you can build a compounding platform that enables more and more discovery over time. That essentially is the complete opposite of the mindset of life science, which is typically chance discoveries with eroding IP value and a limited window of commercialization. And that drives a very different kind of business model and a very different kind of behavior. So in a world of discovery abundance, where our ability to capitulate biology, run experiments and learn from those experiments are compounding over the course of a company, we really think about business model as an evolving strategy instead of a set and forget, sort of pick your door, pick your path, and that defines the entire company. What we see, in, and, and there are a lot of examples of this in the modern biotech, like recursion, uh, is, is layered business models where a company, based on the, 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 the nature of the, the discoveries that are being generated by the platform, pick the best business model almost on a program by program basis. You know, out licensing, software licensing, co-development, upfront revenue and milestone payments. A company like Recursion has all three at this point layered together as a stacked business. If you look at uh, a company like Tempest, another great example, this is a diagnostic testing business that looks a little bit like foundation medicine, but they have this extremely robust data licensing product that has hundreds of biotech and pharma customers just using uh, Tempest as a, as a data source and signing these multi-year long-term deals. So we're, we're really excited about what that means. It means that founders and, and biotechs have more optionality. It means that they're a little bit more resistant to, to market changes, and we're facing all of that right now, in, in that they don't have to forego 
uh, long-term value capture for, uh, with, with these short-term program decisions, but we're seeing industry continue to come to them with partnership and revenue generating opportunities and uh, founders that, that uh, go the distance, they have a lot of flexibility of uh, layering on more business models or maybe more lucrative business models over time. The, the only thing I'd, I'd, I'd quickly add, and I agree hundred percent, there's, if, if you think of the key kind of bit flip that's occurred, it's uh, moving from a realm of scarcity of biological and or composition of matter discovery to a realm of uh, radical abundance in both of those categories. And when you make that bit flip and you switch over, you question, okay, what, what are the new bottlenecks that emerge? And then what are the business models and the business opportunities that can help supplement and or circumvent those bottlenecks? And it's exactly kind of the, the, the topics that Nan touched on. The other thing that is happening too, is I think as the capital stack or as the investment stack matures, you start to see companies, biotechs, especially young biotechs, partner not for the sake of partnering, but have increasing maturity and sophistication with how they think of partnering. And so you're starting to see um, unnamed Series A biotech FUBAR partner with, let's call it uh, GSK, not for the sake of, hey, I really need to kind of show that I can get a partnership because it de-risks my platform in the eyes of an investor who maybe won't understand the technology or the science, but rather because internally they're viewing it as a separate business unit and modeling out the PL of that engagement and really only doing it if the PL is meaningful, if the J curve isn't too deep, and if it's already aligned with the strategic imperative of the company. And, and that's that's that really is a phase shift, not only in tech bio, but generally in biotech that's occurred over the last five or six years. A lot of agreement there, guys. And I would say even taking it a step forward, as you're just describing on what are the bottlenecks and what's coming next. As we think now about this next generation of biology, we'd love to hear your views. What is the dimension hot take of the day on what uh, what is coming next? I, I, I like right now. I am obsessed with what's happening in machine learning, and, and and you can question is that biology or not. I think it's an alien form of biology. It's a form of intelligence in many ways. I think these machines are finding novel manifolds to represent reality, and it's. Um, if you're not thinking about it or you're not obsessing about it, I think you're potentially missing the largest technological update in 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 likely since electricity. I, I, I can't since the industrial revolution. It's hard to really think about anything more meaningful uh, than that, um, and that will parlay and have um, obviously many 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 updates into how uh, discovery and development and 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 the kind of journey from a medicine from start to finish will be executed. But it'll also affect the broader category of, you know, of just humanity and, and the economy. And it's, um, it, I, I constantly kind of pinch myself, uh, you know, what, what full stop, a full stop time, full stop two, full stop B full stop alive, full stop exclamation point. It's, it's, it's insane. And, and if you're not excited about it, then you're, you're in the wrong kind of category of career. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of that will apply itself to this sort of radical abundance of discovery. And, and certainly uh, therapeutic breakthroughs and diagnostic breakthroughs will, will be headline grabbing. And we're gonna see, we've seen a lot of it and we'll see more. Um, I, I think what, what that leads to, if you follow the thread and the, the order of operations here is a pretty significant bottleneck in clinical development and also manufacturing. So uh, as, as we touched on earlier, uh, we really take a holistic view on the whole, on the entire industry at Dimension. And yes, we are working with companies that are work, uh, uh, applying themselves to unblock the discovery side of it, whether it's biological insights and target discovery, uh, uh, biomarker discovery, or uh, composition of matter. Uh, but we're equally excited, if anything, more excited about the unsung heroes of operationally intensive clin dev and manufacturing that needs to be a piece of the puzzle for a, a medicine to make it to market. And, and I think it's going to be increasingly the case that medicines fail to make it to market because of issues in the blocking and tackling, uh, site selection, patient recruitment, patient dropout dur during trials, protocol design, manufacturing defects, and QA. And, and we think that technology will play a really large role there as well. Uh, software, 
for uh, site selection and clinical trial operations, uh, hardware for lab automation and QAQC. So we're, we're very curious and actively looking in those spaces too. Going through and thinking about that further, I would say, A, we're incredibly excited to see the companies you invest in help recognize and realize some of these visions you've described. But to take it completely in another direction, what would you predict in terms of, we're talking about partnerships, pharma engagement with early innovation, given the larger macroeconomic climate, be it piloting, partnering, M&A, just very curious to hear your thoughts. Nan, if you want to start. Yeah, this this was the the topic du jour at JPM 2023. I, I know you, you two were both there. Uh, Zav and I were both there. We spent a lot of time with biotechs, large-scale biotechs, pharma representatives. And I, I think a lot of the, the conference was this testing the waters across all sides around mindset. Um, I think that pharma, pharma is leaning in. Uh, we, we might not be seeing the big ticket M and A uh, announcements quite yet, but uh, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of the state change happening in this industry, new modalities, new technological tools, new data modes being built. Uh, I think there's a universal awareness in pharma that uh, a lot of the the expertise and then the capabilities and and the IP uh, does not reside in their four walls, and and that that's going to be a first for that industry to see so much pace of change and innovation coming from not just the biotechs and the, the sort of entrepreneurial scientists that life science investors have backed, but adjacent industries. Really interesting innovation coming out of DeepMind, of course, with all the, with all the uh, chatter on AI, uh, but you know, increasingly meta research, Google Brain, Microsoft Research, DE Shaw, a FinTech firm. Uh, we, you know, we're seeing so many interesting generalizable tools come out of those uh, research shops that immediately apply and plug into life science. And, and I think pharma has uh, uh, a, a universal recognition that that's happening and a curiosity. And we, we see it manifested in a lot of earlier stage companies finding those partnerships, finding pharma interest very, very early on in their lifetime. And the, this old adage of where's your clinical data package and what's your asset being the ticket to have pharma conversations is no longer valid. I, I think that in a lot of the, the categories that we're excited about, uh, pharma is trying to come in very early to learn and to partner and to find talent, to find acquisition targets. So it, it's a very robust time in the industry. The the the, the two kind of key poles, and um, there's tension between the two. One is the obvious, a, a, a macro pullback. Every large pharma kind of C-suite is dealing in, in, in some form factor today with activist investors who are asking them to divest R&D completely. To only focus on development and then to wait until whatever kind of percolates up from the biotech ecosystem of, of private biotech, uh, whatever percolates up into interesting phase two human proof of concept data before acquiring it. On the other hand, every CC is also actively turning over their organizations, bringing in the likes of a Dean Lee or an Aviv Regev in the case of Merck and, and Genentech uh, into their C-suites and, 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 and head of discovery uh, platforms based on a recognition that this technology uh, of software and data science and machine learning is something that they need to take very, very, very seriously and prioritize. And where that leads to is, I think, really interesting uh, creative partnerships at the early preclinical platform and technology side, coupled with an increasing sophistication and maturity from pharma in terms of how to quickly show commercial value from these platforms without necessarily having to wait the five or six or seven years before you get to that human kind of phase two data that ultimately will come to fruition. It'll just take longer. We've gone through multiple eras of life science innovation today. We started in biotech. You can make the argument we're now in the era of tech bio. Do you have a thought on what the next era to be coined will be and what? I'm still I'm, dude, I'm still not sure how I feel about tech bio. I I, I feel like this is just biotech, and and we're like actually I I listened to a podcast with Vispa Kolaru from Inveter recently, and he he probably had the best explainer for it, which is you know maybe biotech is where the key piece of IP or or the technology is bio itself, and maybe tech bio is where technology is driving biological discovery without a singular kind of piece of biological IP being kind of the kernel of uh of the company or the the genesis of um of the platform. Um, that said, it, it almost feels like uh, semantics 
uh, at this point. And yeah. I think where 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 we tend to get the most success out to mention on Adam and myself is really companies that that intersect the two. And whether they call it biotech or tech bio, um, I I don't think we spend too much time spending you know uh, uh, threading the needle or, or or drawing straws on what name to call it on a particular day. Um, in terms of what a future name might be, TBD, I will say, and, and it's a little bit of a, a quick rambling topic, I think this is one of the problems with the ecosystem. If you go talk to five or six or seven people um, today, you'll get probably eight or nine or 10 answers in terms of what category of company uh, is called what? Is it SynBio? Is it computational bio? Is it computational genomics? Is it is it tech bio? Is it biotech? Is it there, There's so many ways to call the same thing, different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that drives a, a lack of ability, I think, to have really meaningful and accretive conversation. And so one of the things that we aspire for Dimension, um, again, over time, is to is to help kind of set a little bit of the boundary conditions and a sandbox or a town square, so to speak, to actually standardize first the vocabulary and the syntax or the vernacular of this ecosystem, but then ultimately actually drive productive conversation. But you can't have productive. Routine. Maybe that's that's the name. Productive bio. <laughs> because I, I think <laughs> it's just, uh, a little bit of a thing. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is just a steady march of biotech using the best available tools of each era to drive more and more efficient and productive discovery instead of wasteful, sort of uh, un, un, uh, unintentional uh, discovery or interrogation. And and I think we're we're on this steady march towards more and more effective uh, experimental design and more and more uh, encapsulation of experimental learnings, uh, whether that itself should be reinvented as an industry or just seen as, uh, you know, a great sort of golden era of biotech. Uh, I would rather have it tied to the past because I think the best companies that we work with are students of that past and they try to take the best learnings from those groups as possible. They try to take in the best leadership from those groups as possible instead of thinking about themselves as completely uh, circumventing the existing industry, which I think has has a healthy amount of hubris as, associated with that. Not going to get any disagreement from us. And if anything, I think it's <laughs> something where, as you're pointing out, if we could move towards productive bio, recognize that most, if not all models have value and that as we work together, we can really advance uh, hope and health for patients, I think we'd be in a much better position. So shifting it back to Drew uh, quickly to talk about portfolio construction and support. Yeah, and I, I completely agree here, folks, um, on the idea of coining or um, labeling certain areas of certain things. But what I, what I will say, what I'm interested in is, you know, we are, we are definitely in a new era of business model innovations. We're seeing a, a new wave of platform companies, a new integration of computation um, within these this new, next generation of companies. Um, I, I'm definitely curious if, if we're not putting labels on tech bio, biotech, where it is, what it does. Um, I will say with this new area, this new focus of emergence that's within biotech, I'd be really curious within your own portfolio or how you're thinking about founders. Um, would you care to kind of share your mentality or your thought um, of traits and skills that you uniquely view as um, founders that you want to work with, founders you want to invest with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the the biggest one is uh, uh, comfort chartering new, new territory. So uh, most of the founders we work with are either uh, themselves interdisciplinary uh, and, and they've spend time on, on both sides. Either they have a tech background and they somehow became enamored with biotech at some point and, and started doing work there or, or vice versa. They have a scientist background, but through the, the, the lab innovation that's come in the last decade have been increasingly dependent on uh, computation and their daily workflows. We really like folks who, who think about bringing together tools from both disciplines who are both paying attention to uh, new molecular tools and lab assays that make experimentation better, faster, cheaper to run, and also looking at the best models and the best data capture and pipelining that they can build to, to take advantage of what they're generating. Um, so I, I think that's that's the most important piece is we're not looking for folks who are trying to take some sort of company formation template from uh, their prior company or from large pharma and repeat it. Uh, we're not looking for folks who are 
uh, building cleaned up shell companies around single pieces of IP, for example, where it's very rinse and repeat. I think a lot of founders, this was a great example, he, you know, he's come up, but also the software founders, you know, Alex and Sunny at Lamin, uh, Bogdan, Ahmed, David and team at Kaleidoscope. Uh, they're just incredibly curious and and creative people. They're they're uh, chartering new ground in either applying software in a new way in an industry, or this uh, this was stitching together uh, many different technologies to make embed a run. And we really love seeing that creativity. It, like a hundred percent with with everything Nan just listed: high IQ, high curiosity, low low hubris, um, uh, an ability to kind of pivot uh, 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 ideas uh, and make mental model updates. Um, I think any entrepreneur on day zero will look 90% different on day 10. Um, and you're only gonna get to that 90% different if you're comfortable admitting where you were wrong yesterday and um, and updating yourself today. Um, the two kind of fuzzy things that, that that maybe I should point out that that I've kind of thought about over the last uh, decade of finding and selecting and partnering with entrepreneurs, the partners, the, the entrepreneurs who perform best uh, one, there are people in the world who, whenever you talk to them, you leave energized. And then there are people in the world who, whenever you talk to them, you kind of leave a little bit down. And for whatever reason, I truly do believe, and this is so fuzzy, but it's it's just it's just a good rule of thumb, like finding and partnering with people who leave you energized after every conversation with them. Um, the other is there there are math teachers who teach calculus and for whom I can sit in that calculus class, and I, I, I think I'm pretty good at calculus, and for whom I would be confused, right? They, they, they are bad at explaining you the, the kind of cognitive load to understand what's going on in their brain and translate it into a language that makes sense in your brain is very high. And then there are people who could probably teach me um, esoteric algebraic topology from you know Terence Tao, um, and for whom I would understand it almost immediately because they're so good at abstracting what's in their brain and communicating really complex topics well to, at least in this topic, a Luddite like me. And so um, finding entrepreneurs who are the Richard Feynman's who are the entrepreneurs tend to be, I think, the best entrepreneurs. So energizing and cogent and uh, uh, economical uh, with their communications. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic, Zavin and Nan. And I, I think I, I really ask because over the past 10 years, you've been able and to sit on boards and then be involved and invest in some of the most formative biotech companies we've, we've really seen. I mean, between the common portfolios you've seen, I mean, Zymergen and Recursion have been phenomenal investments over the past 10 years. Um, and so it's great to see the the common veins in portfolio that you like to help. And uh, it's good to see how, how you're thinking about that through dimension. Um, and in building off that thread, uh, what I'd really love to talk about, I mean, your investment background, you have seen some amazing founders build amazing companies, um, again, with amazing firms to support them. As you're looking at Dimension and uh, building that next generation of companies and supporting founders, um, using your previous portfolio as a benchmark, how do you think about supporting the next generation of companies through Dimension? Yeah, I, I think we we very much want to be a, a, an arm-in-arm -arm partner with, with our founders. We do not take a passive view to capital. Uh, as a specialty firm, we think that's that's our uh, advantage and opportunity is that we can really dive in into this industry, help galvanize the common KPIs, the common vocabulary, the interlink between different stages of, of uh, capital as companies grow over time. And we're starting to put some of those motions in place already. So I, I expect us to uh, get involved in relatively fewer companies with high conviction and high, uh, high, uh, high spirit of partnership. And, and really build companies alongside our founders. Um, so that means being on support for them uh, in everything from executive searches, company operations, industry interface. Um, uh, I, I think our, our aspiration is to build a specialty firm that is a lighthouse of this space. And uh, through that work, the serendipity of opportunity for portfolio founders, uh, opportunity for us to meet the future founders of tomorrow come from a lot of the, the daily activities that we do, which is not looking at companies one at a time and trying to make one investment at a time, but very much so thinking about uh, how do we uh, really uh, build a support function for uh, the future of life science and all the constituents that are part of it. I think in investing for us as a team sport, so whether it's Adam or Nan or myself who are on the board or point, um, hopefully any entrepreneur you query about their kind of work with Dimension, 
uh, will say I really had access to all three and I saw the differences between all three as hopefully you all are seeing the difference between me and on even here on this podcast. Um, the second point I should add is by design intentionally we've constructed dimension to be um, highly concentrated. And that's a little bit counter shift from where the industry has really trended over the last decade, which has been uh, a higher velocity of capital, lower equity stakes, uh, more deals per partner per year. If we do dimension right, and certainly the way we kind of want to take our at bats is to be uh, curated, selective, and concentrated, which then allows us to spend the appropriate time and build the appropriate surface area with our companies and our portfolio to really kind of be meaningful stewards and partners with our entrepreneurs. Yeah, and as a quick uh, wrap up question here, folks, um, you, you both have had an action packed. Uh, first decade in your VC career backing some of the largest companies in the biotech ecosystem um, has yet to experience. With this comes a lot of battle scars, a lot of learned experiences. Um, with many younger individuals listening to the podcast, interested in your own stories, could you share a few teachable moments that stood out um, in the past decade? I mean, why were they distinct? I mean, what were the lessons or the, the battle scars that really uh, stand out in your own mind? Nothing went wrong. I have no learnings. <laughs> no, no scar tissue here. <laughs> <laughs> what scar tissue? He said defensively. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, uh, no, too too many to name. Uh, maybe we can just do a quick one per for each of us. I'll I'll be quick. One one is um, if you ever find yourself rationalizing your way into an investment where, where you're not excited about the founder or the management team and the entrepreneurs. But for whatever reason, you can kind of do the calculus to get yourself to a yes based on the technology or the science merit. Um, it that's you're better off passing. And so you really, you know, a, a, a necessary bit in the investment calculus has to be this raw excitement about the people that you're partnering with. It's ultimately a people game. Everything else is secondary. On on the founder side. Uh, we talked about a, a blank slate mentality and and there's an opportunity there. And it's also very daunting because you have so many choices uh, in, in front of you. And I think I think the best founders that I've worked with and the, the contrary of this is uh, the founders that have, have, that have had the most trouble have a hard time uh, identifying the sort of singular hypothesis that they're looking to prove out. And I think as long as the founder keeps that there are going to be a hundred things being juggled, but there's always one or two key things that if those go right, 98 can go wrong and the company can still do well. Founders have to really understand what those are in their business. And it has to be driven by the truth of what they have and what the, where the science and the technology points them. It's not what they want or what their investors want or what their customers want, even want. So, uh, uh, you know, I've made mistakes and alongside founders on both sides of that. And I think it, it is... Uh, a strongly delineating factor between success and failure. As, as, as an investor too, I know I'm adding one more pointer here, but as an investor too, I think this was true over the last decade and it will remain true over the next decade. Um, be lazy. And, and what that means is as an investor, you can really fill up your entire day 24, 7, 365 with meetings and Twitter and blog posts and events and whatever, whatever. And, and, and you will always find a monotonic relationship between your time and your success as, as an investor. So you will always have a little bit of low hanging fruit, right. Uh, to kind of continue to kind of do the incremental thing. Um, if you force yourself to be lazy, it forces you to one to not point, have a really clear articulation of what the key decisions and observations per year are per fund. There's a few key decisions that matter per year. There's a few key observations that matter. And if you're lazy, quote unquote, I don't, I'm, I'm saying a little bit tongue in cheek, but I actually think it's true. I actually think I'm, I'm actually pretty lazy just as a person. Um, it helps to, it, it forces cognitive clarity and cogency with your work. Zavin, I think everyone listening is probably an overachiever who greatly appreciates your last point of occasionally taking it easy, taking that time to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Zavin, I know, Zavin I know makes I it look easy. easy. <laughs> And serves as a role model for us all. So thank you both for coming on. Uh, I guess before we come to a close, just one final question is, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share as we wrap up the episode? The, the biggest one for me is that we're we're in the early innings of building a firm. We have, uh, like I said, a, a laundry list of ideas and ambitions for what dimension will become. And none of that can exist without great people. So I would encourage anyone who's 
interested in what we're doing, even if they're not fully formed into a company or something that's pitchable, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in meeting great people. So, uh, you know, our contact will be readily available online and we love meeting folks. So uh, if there's anything stopping anyone from reaching out, don't let it. All we have is time. And it seems like Zavin has a lot of it. So thank you both again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, really we, both, we both are just here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both again, Zavin and Anand, for an absolutely incredible episode. We're very grateful for your time and look forward to having you on again. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you. you, guys. This is fun. Appreciate it.